OCO Nagat, Jennifer Lauren, Dawando. Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Lauren, Cherokee Nation citizen and host of OCO, Voices of the Cherokee People, and Senior Director of Cherokee Film. Welcome to Chala Gi, wherever we are. On today's episode, we'll be discussing Cherokee Nation's contributions to the Violence Against Women Act, or VAWA, as well as the nation's own One Fire Domestic Violence Program and the upcoming Families Are Sacred Summit. While this can be a tough topic to discuss and warning, these conversations may be triggering for some, we feel it is important to address and to spread awareness about what's happening amongst our people and the Cherokee Nation's efforts to keep families safe. Here's the lineup for today's show. First, we'll hear from our Principal Chief, Chuck Hoskin Jr. with a keynote address. Then Chief Hoskin and Delegate to Congress Kim Teehee will join me to answer some more in-depth questions on the topics. Then Attorney General Sarah Hill and Investigator Shauna Roach will join me to discuss more on steps our tribe is taking to keep families safe. After that, we will take a look at a short video that shows the incredible efforts of the One Fire Victim Services team and all of the new resources they are utilizing to keep people safe. Then One Fire Director Deb Proctor and a survivor named Becky talk to us about the struggles many families face and the nation's One Fire program and how it is changing the lives of people for the better every day. Tribal Councilor Candessa Teehee will deliver remarks from the Tribal Council. And finally, Deputy Attorney General Chrissy Nemo closes out our program with final thoughts on how you can help support the tribe's efforts. But before we start, I'll turn it over to the gifted and talented Jeff Payden, who will open our event with spiritual offerings. Osio, I am Jeff Payden, a hospital and hospice chaplain, as well as a victim advocate at One Fire. In the New Testament, Jesus tells a parable in which he says, For I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was hungry. You gave me something to eat. I don't believe Jesus gave us an all-inclusive list of what that means. In fact, I summarize it by saying, I was hurting and you comforted me. And that's why it's my joy and the joy of my coworkers at One Fire to minister grace and peace to those we serve. Would you please join with me in prayer? Creator, Father, you are known by many names, but you are the one who causes the sun to rise in the east and set in the west. You are the one who has breathed into us the very breath of life, and we thank you for the blessings of this day. We thank you for the leaders of the Cherokee Nation and, I, and their commitment to take care of those who are vulnerable. I ask that you would continue to give them courage and strength and wisdom as they lead our great nation. I pray for my coworkers at One Fire. May we not grow weary of doing good, and may we continue to have compassion for those we serve. And finally, Lord, I pray for the victims that we will serve. I pray that they would find a place of refuge. I pray that you would give them hope in a hopeless situation. We thank you for the blessings of this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining me in my prayer. May you have the blessings of this day. Wado. Wado, Jeff. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin Jr. for his remarks. Chief. OCO, I'm Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin Jr. and I appreciate you tuning in today for this edition of Cherokee Wherever We Are. We are taking on a sensitive topic that needs to be addressed in our communities, in our country. We're talking about domestic violence and how it affects our Cherokee families. One of our core values as Cherokee people is holding families sacred. One way that we live out that value at the Cherokee Nation today is by making it a high priority to protect our most vulnerable citizens. And for too many Native women, violence is an ever-present threat. 
It is far too frequent on our reservation in Northeast Oklahoma, just as it is all over America. Together, First Lady January Hoskin and I are personally committed to driving down domestic violence and assault rates. It's a basic human right to live a healthy life free from fear and intimidation. We believe a responsible government makes it a priority to serve its citizens. And we have an obligation at the Cherokee Nation to ensure we make our citizens as safe as possible. We want to strengthen our tribal nation. So we're taking a deeper look to better understand what domestic violence is and what we can do within our 7,000 square mile reservation. As a progressive tribal government, we know we can do more and be more effective for our people. We are taking positive steps in the right direction. We established a task force to protect women and families to create more effective strategies for the future. We created unique human resources training for thousands of employees to educate themselves so that they can better identify what domestic violence looks like. We've added more Cherokee marshals to protect citizens, and we've added more attorneys to prosecute predators. Cherokee Nation has allocated staff who work exclusively on these type of criminal cases. With the leadership of the Council of the Cherokee Nation, we expanded our Tribal Violence Against Women Act to authorize prosecution of non-Indians in domestic violence cases. We increased the capacity and scope of the award-winning One Fire Victim Services Office. That includes the opening of a secure shelter space within our reservation where survivors can go when they are in a crisis. One Fire is already recognized as one of Indian country's most innovative programs when it comes to assisting survivors and their families. It serves the immediate needs of survivors and assists them in healing. Whether it is law enforcement protection, legal analysis, housing aid, job placement, educational needs, or health care, which includes counseling, One Fire represents the best principles of the Cherokee Nation with an emphasis on wellness, culture, and family. I hope we can keep challenging ourselves by continually asking tough questions about what we can do better, how we can be more sensitive, and how we can speak up in a more timely manner and take decisive actions. As my good friend, Deputy Chief Brian Warner says, everyone plays a role in creating the world we want to live in. I believe that, but it takes all of us. Today, I am asking all of us to commit ourselves to raising awareness about domestic violence in order to create a better Cherokee Nation, a safer Cherokee Nation. Providing a safe future for our women and children is an important part of securing a better future for the Cherokee Nation. Our people deserve to live healthy and secure lives within the Cherokee Nation. Wado. Chief Hoskin and Cherokee Nation's Delegate to Congress, Kim Teehee, are joining me now to talk more about this. Thank you so much for joining me. This is obviously a, a very important topic for both of you. And for everyone watching, you know, domestic violence is so pervasive. Probably everyone watching knows somebody who has been affected by this serious issue. Um, so, Chief Hoskin, I'd like to start with you. Your administration has created the task force to protect women and families. Can you tell us what that task force is tasked with and what, why establishing it was so important? Well, and, and this issue is important, and, and this affects everybody, and it affects every community. Uh, what we asked the task force to do was look at what we're currently doing within Cherokee Nation, and that's from a workforce standpoint. What are we doing to support our workforce, educate our workforce? Uh, what are we doing from a law enforcement standpoint, and that is what are we doing to protect victims and, and, and care for survivors of domestic violence, hold lawbreakers accountable? What are we doing there? What resources do we need to, uh, to bring to those efforts? Uh, really take a, a holistic review of everything and then figure out where the gaps are. And we found opportunities to improve, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what you want a task force to do. I mean, the people on this task force were people who are subject matter experts. So people from uh, our law enforcement, uh, our Cherokee Nation Marshal Service, our prosecutor's office, our One Fire, award-winning One Fire Domestic Violence uh, Victims Office, uh, and a variety of other departments that interact in the communities and with people who are dealing with domestic violence. So we had some really wonderful people on there. And again, they found some uh, tremendous opportunities for us to seize. 
Great. And Delegate Teehee, I understand that you were instrumental in the Tribal Law and Order Act of 2010. So can you tell us what is that act and what did it do for tribes' ability to combat domestic violence? Well, real quickly, some background there is that the United States Supreme Court in 1978 issued a ruling called Oliphant versus Suquamish. That court case basically said that tribes no longer had any criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who commit crime on Indian reservations. What else was going on in the 70s, in the late 70s, was the Indian Self-Determination Act. Finally, Congress is starting to deploy resources to tribes, Indian country for economic development, to try to, to, so tribes could start tending to the needs of their citizens and their mm -hmm. communities. Um, and as a result, that started inviting in non-Indians onto the reservation. A large number of Native women were marrying non-Indians too. All of these circumstances were leading to a big gap in law enforcement. So there was a need to address it in a very comprehensive way. So what the Tribal Law and Order Act did was to uh, create an environment where federal government and tribes work together. Mm -hmm. But what the law did specifically is it um, requires a greater guidelines and testing for law enforcement uh, who handle domestic violence and also sex crimes. It improved defendant rights. Um, it also uh, strengthened victim services. Um, there's there's, it, it also created greater sentencing authority. It was really a comprehensive law mm -hmm. that was really intended to set a foundation for other laws to follow. Yeah. And I know that the Violence Against Women Act, or VAWA as, as it's known, is very important legislation for you as well. So for those viewers who may not be familiar with what VAWA is, um, can you tell us a little bit about it and your contributions to that act? So the Violence Against Women Act was really a law that was enacted in the 90s. Uh, President Biden, who was then a senator uh, in the United States Congress, was the architect of that law. And over time, at, at each authorization, uh, that law included provisions that assisted uh, Native communities. But in 2013, with the Tribal Law and Order Act finally passing, uh, there was already a foundation set. And so what this law did was give back to tribes some jurisdiction over non-Indians mm -hmm. in very specific circumstances, domestic violence, dating violence, and violations of protection orders, for example. And those tribes could opt in to assert special jurisdiction uh, over those crimes. Importantly, this was the first time in 35 years that uh, that Congress had addressed the elephant decision in a very mm -hmm. narrow way, but mm -hmm. still in the domestic violence space, giving tribes back the authority they had pre elephant versus Squamish. Yeah, that's huge. All right. And then importantly, to, I just want to yeah. add yeah. that uh, last year uh, in 2022, uh, Chief Hoskin and myself worked directly with the White House and with Congress and with advocates all across the country to ensure that that law was expanded. You see, it had initially just dealt with dating violence, domestic violence, and, and violations of protection orders. Now it involves uh, assault on law enforcement officers, child violence, sexual violence, trafficking, and stalking. And uh, so it has broadened that jurisdiction that tribes can assert. Tribes can opt in to assert that jurisdiction. And fortunately, only 31 tribes have taken mm -hmm. advantage of that special jurisdiction. We're one of them, yeah. I'm proud to say. And it's not because tribes don't want to assert that jurisdiction. I think what has to go hand in glove here is that Congress has to also appropriate the funding that's necessary for tribes to beef up their tribal justice systems. Right, yeah, all right. Um, Chief Hoskin, April 18th through the 20th, Cherokee Nation will host the Families Are Sacred Summit. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what the summit is and about what you want people to know about it it is unprecedented in Indian country, correct? It is, and it's needed. I mean, you think about some of the uh, topics that Kim just delved into. They're complicated. They're the results mm -hmm. of a great deal of advocacy and improvement in the federal law and improvement, uh, consequently, in tribal law. So we are at the Families Are Sacred Summit bringing together uh, really some great experts uh, from different jurisdictions, from the state, from the tribes, different aspects of addressing this issue of domestic violence, whether it's folks that are involved in advocacy and protecting victims and, and, and helping survivors, those involved in law enforcement, those that are really on the front lines of this really difficult situation, like our marshal service, uh, and those who prosecute lawbreakers, bringing everybody together to share best practices, to talk about what's going on now. We are really moving at the speed of light in the Cherokee Nation in terms of particularly criminal jurisdiction. I mean, people have read the headlines about the McGirt case and our expanded jurisdiction 
Commission, the Violence Against Women Act, and the uh, efforts that we undertook last year to seize upon that new opportunity to, again, hold lawbreakers accountable. Mm -hmm. That means we are making lots of changes to Cherokee Nation. We're expanding the Cherokee Nation. But we need to bring people together to find out what works because, you know, Jen, if this was an easy issue, somebody would have solved it a long time ago. Right. This is a complicated issue, and it calls upon us to bring together the best and brightest, and that's what we're trying to do at the upcoming conference. Yeah. Sometimes you have to get everybody in the room. Thank yeah. You. All right. Um, and finally, Chief Hoskin, you mentioned your administration established human resources training mm -hmm. for Cherokee Nation employees so that they can better identify mm -hmm. what domestic violence looks like. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the successes that you've seen from this training? Well, I think there's two things. One is I've heard from specific employees who, who've thanked us for uh, raising uh, this issue to the level we've raised it. And if you go through the training, I've gone through the training, it gets you thinking about your work environment. And if you recognize, as we all do at Cherokee Nation, that we really do have a work family. You want to care for your family. You want to be mindful of your surroundings and what your coworkers are going through. Sometimes that means identifying when someone is dealing with domestic violence and what to do about it. Uh, so in terms of giving them some substantive tools to use as, as coworkers, as managers, as employees, that's good. But the other thing I think, that has been successful is what it symbolizes. It shows our workforce that we care, that this is a big enough issue that we want the whole of the workforce to, to stop what they're doing, focus on this issue and get that training. I think it sends the right message to this big workforce uh, that uh, we have the right priorities when it comes to addressing domestic violence. So I think as time goes by, as, as people continue this training, as new employees come on board, I think we'll be a stronger workforce as a result. Absolutely, makes a lot of sense. Thank you both so much for your insight and for your dedication to this important issue. It's good to learn about all the expanded jurisdiction issues and really interesting. Wado. Well, thank you. Now I'd like to introduce back to our show both Attorney General Sarah Hill and Investigator Shauna Roach. Welcome back to the show and thank you so much for joining us. If you all don't mind, could you quickly summarize your roles as they pertain to today's topic? We'll start with you, Attorney General. So as the Attorney General of the Cherokee Nation, it's uh, my honor and privilege to oversee the office that prosecutes all crime in the Cherokee Nation, including all crimes of domestic violence. And also our office does a lot of uh, legislation drafting for the tribal council. So we'll put forward laws that we think should be amended or changed to help improve prosecution of crime. Great. And Shauna? Morning, my name is Shauna Roach with Cherokee Nation Marshal Service. Been there quite a while. My role there, as I said, is a, I'm an investigator. I, uh, I do a lot of primary cases with domestic violence. I do training with domestic violence for our officers in and I also train outside of our department for domestic violence. Okay, so my first question is for you, Shauna. Uh, you know, what role does the marshal, do the marshals play when it comes to combating domestic violence? And then what's your specific role as an investigator? Well, we are uh, more than likely gonna be first on scene whenever, you know, we receive a call. So our priority is to make sure the safety of that victim and get them to where they feel comfortable and they know that they're safe. Um, me, I am an investigator. I'm usually second that receives the call after patrol. And um, depending if it's a major crime, which can be strangulation, you know, or uh, domestic and presence of children's a lot of times that, that I will deal with. So my main goal, you know, as an investigator is the major crime side. Great. And then as you stated before, you also help train the marshals yes. so that when they arrive on scene of domestic violence, yes. they know what they're... Yeah, I do uh, in-house training on domestic violence. That, that includes VAWA in the training. Okay, great. Um, Attorney General Hill, at the top of the show, Chief Hoskin mentioned that Cherokee Nation has added more attorneys to prosecute domestic violence cases and allocated staff who work exclusively on these types of criminal cases. So what has that allowed you to do uh, in combating domestic violence? So that's been a, a great um, thing for us at the AG's office. So, you know, previously, 
you know, cases were assigned sort of regionally based on what region where the crime occurred. We just signed a prosecutor who was working in that particular region. Um, and that, that works out okay. Um, but domestic violence crimes are difficult to prosecute or they can be. They have to be evidence-based prosecutions that requires a lot of communication with the local law enforcement agency to be sure. Have I got the names of all the witnesses? Have we talked to everyone? Do we have all of the pictures from the scene? Um, and that requires a little bit more intensive work. And so that gave us the opportunity to put together a domestic violence response team. Mm -hmm. So we have inside the AG's office a team that exclusively works on domestic violence prosecutions. So we have a prosecutor, actually we have two prosecutors who work on those cases. We have an investigator assigned who's actually a law enforcement um, person who's got law enforcement background who works for the AG's office who can help investigate and collect evidence on those cases. So we find that that has been a much more successful model and it's also much more victim focused. So we can work directly with those victims um, and make sure they understand the process and how those cases are being, um, how, where they are at in the process and what they can expect next. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and Shauna, as Chief Hoskin also mentioned, Cherokee Nation has added more marshals to protect citizens from assault and violence. So what have you witnessed as a result of those additions? Um, it's been amazing. It's helped us out tremendously having those extra officers out there in the field to be able to respond faster. We have also grown with more female officers, which has been, you know, we, we have seen a lot of domestic violence in cases that if the victim is a female, they would want a female officer. So that has definitely tremendously been a huge step. Yeah, that's, I can I can imagine. Um, Attorney General Hill, Cherokee Nation has expanded tribal VAWA law to authorize prosecution of non-Indians in domestic violence cases. So can you explain to viewers why this is so important and what it means for Cherokee people? Sure. So typically the tribe lacks jurisdiction over non-Indians who commit crimes in Indian country. Um, but Congress restored tribal jurisdiction in a couple of different circumstances under the Violence Against Women's Act. So they would took those acts as an opportunity to restore tribal jurisdiction. In the first round of restoration of tribal jurisdiction, they restored jurisdiction over crimes related to domestic violence, which was a huge benefit because now if a non-Indian was in a tribal community victimizing Native women, uh, the tribal officers, the marshal service could go make an arrest and they could be prosecuted in tribal court. And that made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, but there were still some gaps that existed there. It wasn't possible to prosecute um, non-Indians who committed crimes against people they weren't in a relationship with, so sexual assault against strangers, mm -hmm. uh, the tribe black jurisdiction over them. And also if that individual assaulted the officers during the arrest, the tribe black jurisdiction over those individuals for those crimes. So when the VAWA was reauthorized, those were expanded yet again, and they restored tribal jurisdiction a second time to another group of crimes um, where they had a jurisdiction again. And so the tribe then changed its law to claim jurisdiction over those certain classes of non-Indians. So it has been a game changer. It has made the difference um, in Indian country, I think. So when it comes to those um, new crimes that are associated with domestic violence, a follow-up question is, does, um, does there have to be a domestic violence crime in order for you all to claim that jurisdiction over those other crimes that have been added? We, we don't have to have a domestic violence crime for those, which is which is really good because especially in cases of sexual assault where you have a stranger sexual assault, um, that can make the difference. Or if you have people who are friends, but there's a sexual assault, they don't have a prior dating relationship, that would have been excluded under the previous law, mm -hmm. but it is included under the laws that exist today. All right. Um, sticking with you, A.G. Hill, as we've mentioned throughout the show, the Families Are Sacred Summit is coming up next week. So can you tell us why this is such an important summit to hold right now? So I think, you know, there's never a, there's always a good time to be talking about how to prevent domestic violence. There's always a, it's always a good time to be talking about how to strengthen families. And certainly, um, I think this is a great time to be doing it. Coming out of the pandemic, I think we've, you know, throughout the United States, we've seen people battling um, a lot of different issues in their lives, battling substance abuse, battling violence, uh, battling, you know, certainly 
I mean, all the different battles a person can have, they've just been intensified, I think, in these last few years. And I think it's time to have a summit, to have discussions about how do we solve these problems by working together. And having this, the Families are Sacred Summit is a way for law enforcement throughout the reservation, state law enforcement, tribal law enforcement, local law enforcement, to all come together and talk about how do we resolve these issues, healthcare, interdisciplinary ways of discussing these things. Because domestic violence is not, a, it's not an issue that exists in one area, but it's one that is, exists this across a lot of different areas. And we all have to get together to focus on protecting these individuals if we're gonna be successful. It has to be our, our continued focus together to protect families and to protect women. And I think that's what this summit will help us do. Great, it's great to see Cherokee Nation leading the way and bringing all those folks together. Um, I'll be there, it's gonna be really interesting to see everything. Um, I wanted to ask you, Shauna, uh, domestic violence comes in a lot of different forms. What are some of the signs that viewers, you know, can be aware of to know about when it comes to domestic violence? Um, what, what should they do if they believe that someone that they know might be experiencing domestic violence? Well, um, I can say domestic violence can be a very touchy situation. And a lot of times people do not, you know, think about or they're scared to go to law enforcement. So we do have an awesome one, you know, one fire that has an advocacy center, which they can also use that option instead of coming to law enforcement. So we, you know, we try to, when we're out teaching, we let them know that we do have the advocates at one fire that can help them if they do not want to come and report to law enforcement. So that way they can get some kind of help or something, you know, something there for them that they're not just out there alone. Some expertise, people yes. who have dealt with this time and time again that can guide them in a, in a certain way. Yes. Great. Uh, well, that's going to be all the time we have for our questions with you all today. But thank you so much for sharing your expertise and knowledge. And we look forward to the summit next week. Wado. Thanks, Jen. Up next, we have a short video from the recent opening of the new One Fire Victim Services Shelter. Take a look. part of society without the burdens of being a victim of violence. And that's what this facility can provide. Our First Lady, uh, January Hoskin, it really encouraged us to make domestic violence uh, intervention and, and helping survivors uh, something that's a priority for the Cherokee Nation. So we, when we saw this property and could acquire it, we sort of imagined what it could be for that purpose. It provides wraparound services that One Fire provides and our other departments provide so that a family can go from really desperate situations uh, in the grips of domestic violence to a path of healing that can include things like employment, making sure there's a safe way to get to and from school. So we have seven apartments inside the shelter itself. There are six two-bedroom apartments and there is one efficiency apartment. On the shelter grounds are three three-bedroom homes. So total is 10, but it depends on the woman has uh, several children or she's alone, but, but that's what we can accommodate. We do cover the 14 counties in our reservation area, in our Cherokee reservation, and we do uh, an in-depth intake to see what the needs are for each individual client. And then we help them develop a plan that's individual for them. And I'm proud of the Council of the Cherokee Nation. I'm proud of the task force on, uh, on this subject that the Deputy Chief and I and panel, all of those efforts. We are already at almost 800 clients for the year of 2022. Last year in 2021, it was 440. So you can see that the need has grown exponentially. Not only do we have this great building, but really the important thing is the staff and the individuals that, that work with One Fire. Uh, they have a big task ahead of them, they, they are, but they're seasoned veterans. They, they work with many other places that, that shelter domestic violence victims. And so this is just one of the things that we can do to try to give back, to take those next steps into rebuilding uh, in the namesake of love, uh, but rebuilding that family unit. It's so important. Our goal is to work on empowerment and what, do, what does the victim need to empower them to live independently in, in a life without abuse and violence. I know that this facility is going to be the start of a better life for so many women and families. This facility will serve anyone who needs help. So 
whether whether you're a tribal citizen or not, you can reach out to One Fire and you can take a step to beginning a new life. Wow, what a wonderful facility with so many good resources. I'm sure it's doing a lot of good to help those in need and such a passionate staff. Super impressed. Okay, now I am joined by One Fire Director Deb Proctor and domestic violence survivor Becky. Uh, we're going to discuss the ins and outs of Cherokee Nation's innovative and award-winning One Fire program. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Our pleasure. Deb, you are the director of Cherokee Nation's One Fire program. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how your experience helped you to do this important work? Certainly. Uh, having grown up on the uh, campuses of four uh, Indian boarding school, uh, where my father worked, my mother was a nurse, um, and throughout my uh, nearly 47 years as a healthcare professional, um, I've had a front row seat to uh, the domestic violence situation in Indian country and the need to intervene and stop the cycle. Um, I've just seen about uh, every aspect of it throughout my life. Mm. And it has led to uh, where I am today to try to help others. Yeah, heartbreaking um, to have that front row seat, but I guess it gave you, you know, Mm -hmm. the drive to do what you do to help so many other people. So when and why was One Fire established and what are some of the accomplishments that you are most proud of since then? So um, One Fire Services has um, been providing uh, services uh, for 10 years. Secretary of State Head, it was his vision to uh, provide services for domestic violence, uh, sexual assault, uh, family violence, stalking, and um, he was taken suddenly, but it is his vision where it began. Um, and so uh, we've made a lot of progress. We were able to uh, provide four uh, transitional housing apartments in Tahlequah. We have opened a, our domestic violence shelter in Stillwell, which accommodates uh, 10, it has 10 units. Uh, we have other plans in the future. Uh, one really important factor that we are aware of in Cherokee Nation is that just housing uh, a survivor uh, doesn't necessarily fix or heal. So it's very important to have wraparound services. Uh, we know that uh, survivors will return on an average seven times, and there's evidence that that's rising mm. uh, among the trends in the nation the numbers are going up. So it's important to individualize that service. What does that client need mm -hmm. to start their healing journey, to stop the cycle of violence in their life? Okay. And so we've come up with a number of innovative approaches for that. We'll be starting support groups in the very near future at the shelter. We will also have 24 um, seven availability online. Uh, we'll be bringing in some culture aspects. We're starting a garden. There's a, there's just a number of things that we are promoting to help our clients that are there. Each one of those things you just listed sounds like it would be great. Mm -hmm. um, so, Becky, thank you again for joining us today and for sharing your experiences with One Fire. Uh, what can you tell us about your experiences with One Fire Services and how they've helped you on your journey? Well, thank you for having me. <clears throat> and... Um, one fire came into my life four years ago. And as a result of a domestic violence situation I was involved in that um, um, led to my home being burned to the ground and me having um, countless uh, physical um, things happen to my body. Um, one fire came in and I was assigned to a gentleman by the name of JR as my advocate. And JR taught me um, little by little step by step, the smallest of things from um, going to the grocery store to uh, having to uh, to fill out paperwork to get my utilities turned on. These small, these things I had forgotten how to do. I'd forgotten how to, to actually learn how to live. I forgot how to make decisions on my own. 
and Jr. helped me with these things. He um, he empowered me by going with me, not doing them for me, mm-hmm. but going with me to stand there with me as I did it. Um, what what one fire did for me was it 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 gave me the protection and the empowerment of a nation behind me, mm-hmm. knowing that um, I'm not alone and that they believed me. They were one of the first people. JR, um, as well as a, a, maybe two other people that actually said, I believe you and I'm sorry that happened. Um, so often in a domestic violence situation, women will believe that they're crazy and that they did it and that and if they'd acted better, then it wouldn't have happened. And I was one of those women. The brainwashing is, is pretty significant. And little by little, I mean, sentence by sentence, it's still four years out from that date that it all started and all ended. Uh, I'm still unraveling mm-hmm. the um, brainwashing, but oh, I'm, I'm, I'm thriving imagine. today as a result. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. So glad. Can you tell us about what the Violence Against Women Act means to you and how that VAWA has helped in your life? I absolutely can. It's a great question, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, honored to talk about that. It is a an act that is, um, you know, like his um, 1994. It was in- established, and it's been um, it's been <sighs> amended every five years since then. The last amendment was in, in 2022, and what that did for me because my violence ended in in 2019. So I'm still in the midst of, of, of legalities, if you will, about mm-hmm. it. And so um, that act brought stiffer sentences. You know, my, my, my abuser has not been held accountable yet. But today, with it being 2022, um, the act, you know, just last year being passed, the, the amount of, of uh, support I have for strangulation, for sex assault, for stalking, those are three things that are very um, prevalent in my story. And I know that today, because of that and the support and with Cherokee Nation um, supporting that, it's, it's, been, it's been comfort to me. Mm-hmm. But I'd also like to add that because of that act and the nation taking it so seriously, they trained their advocates about and in, on a more in on a more detailed level mm-hmm. about strangulation, about traumatic brain injury, about stalking, not just stalking driving by your house, but on the internet, um, through other people. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. they they trained their advocates so that they, you know, Jr. could talk to me, say, "Sis, is this happening to you?" Because yeah. so who would have think that? You know what? I keep getting these spam emails that don't make any sense from all these strange places. This was something that was happening that was internet related. I would never have thought, but see, he had that training and he knew so I could be protected even on those crazy ways. Um, So the training that they got because of those topics, they're able to give to people like me, a survivor. Right. So it's not just that they're doing it. They're actually, they're, they're walking their talk. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be speaking at the Families Are Sacred Summit. Can you give us a sneak peek about what you're going to be talking about? Um, <laughs> that's a great question. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> well, people will want to hear, okay. you know, what One Fire has done for you. So. You know, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful and I'm blessed to say I have no secrets. There are some raw parts of my story. There are some, some amazing parts of my story. I can tell you today, I'm four years free from domestic violence. That's an amazing accomplishment because it doesn't happen like that. Um, it's been because of the sacrifices of not just one fire, uh, Cherokee Marshals, but, but Talquad Police Department. Mm-hmm. Um, um, that wrap cr- around. It is in, and, and yeah. Talquad is an amazing place because Cherokee Nation has taken the time to educate, mm-hmm. not just county and city, but, but the community as a whole. Mm-hmm. And because of that, um, I, my story is beautiful, and I'm very, very great. Angels all around Tahlequah for me. Um, one of the things I think, if asked and if it's appropriate, I'd like to talk about the importance of the first responders to say, you know, I, I had I had Adair County Sheriff's Department at my house many times, mm-hmm. and I didn't leave. And it wasn't that I wasn't in danger and it wasn't that I was about to die or be killed. It's just, I didn't leave. It wasn't safe enough. Mm-hmm. 
So I understand and I want to 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 give some empathy to those first responders that are like, she's never going to go. Why are we wasting our time? Mm-hmm. No, they weren't. They planted a seed every time. Yeah. By showing up, they planted a seed of saying, I believe something's happening. You're not telling me. So so I, I want to be able to give back to those officers and yeah. those people if I can. Great. And it's important um, for you to share your experiences. Can you say why you feel like it's important? I know that um, I've been asked over the past four years countless times to share my experience, strength, and hope about the um, what my journey has been. Um, you know, part of my journey um, involved um, an extreme, I call it a raging addiction to drugs and alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, that was part of the, of the violence, keeping me unclear in my mind so mm-hmm. I wouldn't leave, mm-hmm. so I wouldn't... Uh, know what was actually happening around me. Right. Uh, for me to be able to share my story, I'm able to help those women that were like me, scared, confused, um, unsure, insecure, a shell of a person, um, not understanding the emotions that I had. I had people that were there for me. I wanna be there for them, but I also wanna, I wanna advocate that drugs and alcohol go hand in hand Mm -hmm. with domestic violence. Um, I I can tell you in my story, I I became highly addicted to drugs and alcohol, but I was, it was my responsibility once I was safe to get into recovery and Mm -hmm. I did. But I, it's very important to, um, let those people in the community, those first responders understand they're not just a drug addict or an alcoholic. They're, they're somebody trying to not die in domestic mm-hmm. violence. And and you are an example of that. You know, you can be successful in getting away from all of it. So it's great that they'll be able to hear from you at that conference. Yeah. You know, it does take a tribe. Mm-hmm. It takes a tribe mm-hmm. of people. And um, one of the things that JR would tell me is he would say, go be Cherokee sister. And I would do I that. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you. Deb, uh, Cherokee Nation's One Fire Victim Services are award-winning and innovative. Can you talk about some of the awards One Fire has received and what makes it so innovative? Yes. So um, in 2021, um, uh, Cherokee Nation's One Fire uh, received the um, Harvard Award. Uh, I believe it was one of six uh, tribes that received it for their high uh, services. It is. And uh, so that's uh, very, very important. Uh, And then when we talk about innovation, uh, we we have to understand, as as Becky referred to, empowerment. But what is that? What does that mean for that individual? Um, What what does that person need for their resources? And um, um, think outside the box. Again, some of the things we mentioned earlier, um, you know, maybe you just need support groups. Maybe you need referrals for uh, therapy. Maybe you need uh, a place to just heal. And mm-hmm. that's that's some of the things that we're going to honor. Um, we've um, spent a number of uh, hours in our community just these last nine months, just getting the, the message out. Uh, that's, that's part of... Um, uh, being part of your community and knowing that people have a place to call and be for safety. So we've done a number of presentations on all different kinds of disciplines and settings. So we will continue to think outside the box. We will continue to uh, support wraparound services to be innovative. Uh, we want to take the lead, and uh, we take it very serious. So That is apparent, and, um, yes. So. Great job. Yeah. So if someone's in crisis or knows someone experiencing domestic violence um, yes. and needs immediate assistance, where can yes. they access One Fire Services? Okay. So there's a number of ways. Uh, we do have uh, some that, that come to the office, but we can also go on scene. Um, if, if a person is in danger, always, always, always law enforcement has to come in first and secure it, and then we can go. But also, if if you're just beginning and you're wondering, is this the way to live? Call us. Call us, and we will help you. We will schedule an intake. We can walk you through it. Uh, as Becky said, m- sometimes you don't even know how to go get hygiene items, food. We can We can help with all those. But call us. If you're just beginning to question, we will answer and uh, again, we can schedule an intake. You don't have to come in person. 
Uh, we have a hotline after hours. And we're going to put those numbers on the screen right now for you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then during the day, uh, we have the main number. We also have an email that if, you know, you just, maybe you've got a private email that your uh, perpetrator isn't monitoring. And so we, we're pretty... Um, innovative on how we can talk to, to women. We, we're very cautious about um, reaching out because that can create a, a violent situation. So right. we have to allow that person to, uh, uh, the room to contact us without us causing any more harm. Absolutely. But reach out to us and, um, you know, having, having been a survivor from childhood and as a young woman myself, I. I know it's possible. I know it's possible to survive and I know it's possible to live and, and live well. And that's what we would want for all survivors. Mm-hmm. And um, it's been an honor to, to be a part of One Fire. Great. Well, thank you so much for everything you do. Thanks for sharing your insights and your story and your insights. That's all the time we have for now. Okay, so thank you. Much. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Now, Cherokee Nation Tribal Counselor Candessa Teehee shares a message from the council. Osio, Candessa Teehee Tawado Yonek Siwo Tawado Jalik. In English, my name is Candessa Teehee, and I serve Tahlequah District 2 on the Cherokee Nation Tribal Council. Traditional Cherokee people believe as one of our core cultural values. Those two words together, mean that we are all to hold one another's existence as sacred, and this belief should guide how we treat one another at all times. In Cherokee Lifeways, all people are to be treated as sacred and as equally important in our communities. And for Cherokee women, this power and importance was historically recognized because women were the sole owners of domestic property. Clan membership, which was once the basis for Cherokee citizenship, could only be passed from mother to child. And Cherokee women have always held vital roles in our ceremonies. In historic Cherokee communities, women were life givers, and they also gave access to citizenship held property and served as the linchpin of Cherokee families. However, in these modern times, it is a shocking truth that four out of five indigenous women will experience violence and that this violence often will come at the hands of a partner. And Cherokee women are no exception to this sobering statistic. Women and children in Cherokee Nation are experiencing the trauma of family violence. But Cherokee Nation is taking proactive steps to combat this problem. Although there is no simple, easy answer, Cherokee Nation is dedicated to eliminating violence against women and to healing our families and our communities. I was proud to serve as the council representative to the task force to protect women and families established by executive order in December, 2022. The Cherokee Nation Domestic Violence Lethality Reporting Act of 2021 legislation, which I proudly sponsored, mandates the use of lethality assessments in situations where domestic violence has occurred. The task force also recommended expanding services and increasing staffing. And Cherokee Nation has stepped forward to meet those identified needs in a number of ways. For example, we have seen Cherokee Nation open a full-time domestic violence shelter with the space and services to house multiple families. But despite these advancements, we still have a long road ahead as our nation continues to take active steps to create wraparound services and support for survivors of family violence. I truly believe these steps will help our families and our communities realign with our cultural teachings. These changes are helping to bring the deeply Cherokee idea of to the forefront so we as a people will again hold our women and children as sacred. Wadon. Wado Counselor Tihi. And now Deputy Attorney General Chrissy Nemo provides closing remarks, followed by Cherokee National Treasurer Tommy Wildcat to close us out. As always, Wado for being here. Dodadago Hunty. 
OCO, I am Chrissy Ross Nemo, the Deputy Attorney General for Cherokee Nation, and I am so proud to be joining you today as we wrap up this important and informative conversation about protecting women and families within the Cherokee Nation Reservation. As you heard on today's program, Cherokee Nation remains committed to protecting women and children from violence. More than ever, our government is stepping up to support survivors of domestic violence. Through the leadership of our administration and the Council of the Cherokee Nation, we have more resources, more staff, and stronger laws to protect Cherokees and to prosecute perpetrators within our reservation. We are leading Indian country when it comes to exercising our sovereign rights to bring justice for Native survivors. Native American women suffer from violent crime at some of the highest rates in the United States. With non-Indians constituting a significant percent of the overall population living on the Cherokee Nation Reservation, it is imperative we have the jurisdictional authority to protect our citizens. The Cherokee Nation believes a responsible and respectful government should make it a priority to serve survivors of domestic violence. Working together, the Attorney General's Office, the Cherokee Nation Courts, and the Cherokee Nation Marshal Service more effectively combat abuse and violence. We will continue to offer innovative programs and services that curb the rate of domestic abuse and provide services to both survivors and perpetrators. The tribe has an award-winning blueprint for how to help women and families in emergencies, the One Fire Advocacy Program. It represents the best values of the Cherokee Nation with an emphasis on wellness, culture, and family. Our people deserve to live healthy and secure lives within the Cherokee Nation. We have always looked at how our decisions will impact the next seven generations. Providing a safe future for our children and grandchildren is an important part of securing that future. Wado.
Awa, no dog or high in the garden, the away and the jalagi.